This is the third in our series on putting the new, the proposed Chilean constitution in international context. The first two, for those of you who, those of you who couldn't join us were on economic rights and social and property rights. The videos of those events, as uh, all our events, including this one, are available uh, at our website at ccacanada.com. Uh, I want to remind those who haven't received notification yet that after this one, our next one will be next Wednesday, and that will be one on women's rights in international context in the Chilean constitution. And that will also have, as we have today, as I will introduce, uh, internationally renowned panelists. The one on women's rights will include Rebecca Cook from the law faculty at University of Toronto, Isabel Jaramillo from the law faculty at Los Andes in Bogota, Ruth Rubio Marin, who is a professor at Universidad de Sevilla, and Domingo Lovero, who I'll introduce uh, from Diego Portales, Janiga uh, Zuniga uh, from Universidad de Austral from Chile will be joining us, and Marta Blackwell from the Canadian Council for the Americas will be hosting. So we hope you can join us next Wednesday as well at 10 o'clock Eastern. Um, I just want to thank again, Domingo Lovera, uh, who is the head of the public law program at the Universidad Diego Portales uh, for collaborating very, very closely with us without his help and, and the institutional help of Portales. I don't think we would be able to bring this program to you or certainly not the quality with which we, uh, we are trying to achieve uh, with the panelists that we have today. I, with that, I don't think I have any more housekeeping matters to take care of. Um, so let me start by introducing today's panelists and then turn it over to Domingo who will make some opening comments and then turn it over to Dominique who will be the moderator of today's program. Uh, today's panelists are Linda Collins. She's a professor at the Center of, for Environmental Law and Global Sustainability at the University of Ottawa. As I mentioned, Dominique Hervé is a associate professor of the Faculty of Law at the Universidad de Diego Portales. Luke Laverson, who's a president of the Constitutional Court of Belgium and also president of the EU Forum of Judges for the Environment and a professor of emeritus of the Great Law School at Ghent University in Belgium. Uh, Domingo Lovero, who I've mentioned, is associate professor of public law at Diego Portales and Jimmy May is a distinguished professor at Widener University, Delaware School of Law, and is also founder of the Global Environmental Rights Institute at Widener as well. Uh, with that, uh, I turn it over to you, Domingo. Thank you. Um, thanks, Ken. Uh, I, just, I just want to give a brief uh, welcome to this webinar on behalf of the uh, Programa de Derecho Público uh, and the Programa de Derecho y Política Ambiental of Universidad Diego Portales, and also thank the Canadian Council for the Americas. It has been truly an amazing uh, partnership that we have built with the uh, Canadian Council. Uh, I did my, my PhD in, in Canada, York University. I have a Canadian daughter, so I still hold uh, Canada close to my heart. Uh, and this is, has been truly an amazing, uh, um, kind of re retouching again with, with Canada uh, through this kind of series. So the idea, as Ken said, is uh, to convene international experts uh, in the field and ask you uh, for your impressions. What would you think if you, I don't know, walking, come across with the provisions contained in the proposed constitution. And the idea of having you uh, to comment on these provisions is to have a fresh and, and, and from outside a vision of the provisions because we are here uh, involved in a heated, heated uh, political uh, debate and controversy about uh, these provisions. So uh, I want to thank James, uh, Luke and Linda for being with us today. And without uh, further ado, I leave you with uh, Professor Dominique Herbe, who is going to uh, moderate uh, this panel. Thanks. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for this invitation to Ken Domingo and the Canadian Council. I'm very honored to share this panel with the, our uh, co-panelists. And uh, the, the idea of this panel will be 
the following. I will uh, give a brief introduction to the text of the proposal of the constitution regarding environmental and natural protection uh, norms. I will give this brief introduction in Spanish. So um, if you need to uh, hear it in English, you can uh, choose the translation for English. After that, after my brief introduction, I will give the word to the panelists in the following order. First, James, afterwards, Luke, and finally, Linda. And they will have about 10 to 12 minutes to comment on whatever issue they think is important to highlight of this uh, text of the proposal of the new constitution. And then after that, we'll have some time for questions and for a second round of comments from our panelists. So um, without any other word, I will go on with the introduction of the text. Este texto de propuesta constitucional se caracteriza, a mi juicio, por un nuevo enfoque y un nuevo contexto en materia ambiental. Hay un cambio de paradigma eh, respecto a lo que existe en el derecho ambiental nacional actualmente. El cambio de paradigma consiste fundamentalmente en que se trans transita a un enfoque ecocéntrico respecto a la protección del medio ambiente, junto también con una visión antropocéntrica respecto de ciertos aspectos. También es muy interesante que este debate ambiental fue transversal en términos de la discusión constitucional. Se incorporó el tema ambiental en todas las comisiones temáticas respecto a la discusión constitucional. El texto entonces, específicamente respecto a medio ambiente, propone lo siguiente. En primer lugar, se garantizan varios derechos fundamentales relacionados con el medio ambiente. En particular, el derecho a un medio ambiente sano y ecológicamente equilibrado, el derecho al aire limpio, el derecho a la ciudad y al territorio, el derecho a un mínimo vital de energía y, importante, el derecho humano al agua y al saneamiento. Para hacer eh, efectivos estos derechos, se consagra también una acción constitucional de tutela de los derechos fundamentales, que en materia ambiental tiene una legitimación activa amplia, es decir, se consagra una acción popular ante los tribunales ambientales que serían tribunales especializados de primera instancia a lo largo del país. Se garantizan también derechos fundamentales de contenido económico que eh, importantemente tienen límites en materia de protección al medio ambiente y a la naturaleza. Refleja este cambio de paradigma la declaración, ¿no es cierto?, de que Chile es un estado ecológico de que existen ciertos principios ambientales constitucionales que, que expresamente se identifican como el preventivo, el precautorio, el de progresividad, el de justicia ambiental y muy innovadoramente a mi juicio el de acción climática justa. Es decir, el contexto en el que se incorpora este, este texto constitucional es de una, eh, un reconocimiento de que existe una crisis climática y una crisis ecológica y que por lo tanto se requiere, ¿no es cierto?, una modificación eh, fundamental en términos de cómo vamos a establecer las bases de protección ambiental. Otro aspecto fundamental del contenido de la carta de la propuesta es que se reconoce a la naturaleza como sujetos de derecho, es decir, se garantizan los derechos de la naturaleza y se crea una defensoría de la naturaleza, que es una institución autónoma que tiene por objeto proteger estos derechos tanto de la naturaleza como los derechos ambientales de las personas. Otra cuestión muy importante es la eh, creación o incorporación del deber de custodia pública de los bienes comunes naturales. Esta es una traducción de la doctrina del public trust al derecho nacional. Es una adaptación que no sigue necesariamente la, la mis, el mismo alcance que la doctrina del public trust, pero que se funda en esa, en esa idea y en esa doctrina que ha sido largamente discutida en otros países se eh, vincula este deber de custodia pública a los bienes comunes naturales. Es una categoría nueva que crea la Constitución, eh, que identifica los elementos de la naturaleza que tienen un, eh, una relevancia o que son críticos ambientalmente como bienes comunes naturales respecto de los cuales 
el Estado ejerce este deber de custodia. Lo interesante es que esta categoría de bienes comunes naturales no está de, determinada por la titularidad o por la propiedad de estos bienes, por lo tanto, pueden ser bienes públicos, privados o también inapropiables. Y aquí hay un punto relevante, que la, el texto constitucional establece que el agua en particular se constituye como un bien común natural inapropiable. Respecto de estos bienes comunes naturales inapropiables, que es fundamentalmente el agua y algunos bienes ambientales del borde costero, se establece que el Estado debe administrarlos con eh, ciertos estándares de gobernanza que dicen relación con la equidad, con la participación, con la solidaridad. Esa, el Estado puede otorgar autorizaciones de uso respecto de estos bienes comunes naturales inapropiables y en particular respecto del agua elabora una serie de normas que definen el estatuto de las aguas, dentro de las cuales se crea una agencia del agua, se crea también eh, un sistema de gobernanza específico con participación ¿no es cierto? de los distintos actores involucrados en la gestión del agua, y muy interesantemente o muy eh, relevantemente identifica que estas autorizaciones de uso serán incomerciables. Cuestión que claramente apunta, ¿no es cierto?, una modificación de lo que ha existido hasta ahora en Chile respecto al sistema de gestión de las aguas en las cuales se ha creado un mercado de agua. Y finalmente también incorpora un estatuto de los minerales, que es un estatuto breve en comparación con el que se eh, encuentra actualmente en la Constitución, y por lo tanto deja la mayor parte de las definiciones en materia de recursos minerales a la legislación que se dicte eh, con posterioridad. Estas son las disposiciones principales, sin perjuicio hay una serie de otras normas a lo largo del texto eh, de la propuesta constitucional que se refieren también a a la protección del medio ambiente, pero no me voy a referir a ellos ahora porque eh, no tenemos tiempo y, y la idea es que la discusión se centre en estas normas que son las principales que eh, definen ¿no es cierto? lo que serían las bases fundamentales de la protección de la naturaleza y el medio ambiente eh, en el nuevo texto constitucional. So after this brief introduction, I will change back to English and I will give um, the floor to James May. Thank you so much, Dominic, uh, and for, thank you for that wonderful overview of what looks to be a transformational uh, constitutional draft in a time of transition um, in Chile and uh, South America and throughout the world. It's a real honor to be a part of this conversation. Let me tell you about my task. Uh, I'm here to talk about a few provisions of the proposed constitution uh, concerning a right to a healthy environment, rights of nature and environmental justice in about 10 minutes. Uh, let me thank um, Ken Frankel and uh, the Canadian Council for the Americas again for this opportunity. And it's just such a pleasure to be on this panel um, with, uh, with Luke and Linda um, as well. Uh, do you know what's happening toward the end of this month? The United Nations General Assembly will be considering whether to recognize a right to a healthy environment. Now, that, that will be a follow up to the United Nations Human Rights Council recognizing that right uh, late last year. So it's part of a, a global movement toward recognition of a right to a healthy environment. Um, for example, as uh, Linda has written about in her terrific book on uh, ecological constitutionalism. So, uh, So the constitution in draft form now, uh, at least by my eye, and I'll be curious to hear what Linda and Luke think about this, but it, will be state, it would be state of the art, environmental constitutionalism. Uh, so let me start with the first provision that I'm focusing on, which is um, provision, in, provision 104, and let me read it. Everyone has the right to a healthy and ecologically balanced environment. So in those words, what we see is that um, Chile would be um, joining uh, countries from all around the globe that recognize um, that right. So first, let me tell you a little bit about how that right has evolved and what difference it's made. Um, well, you know, the idea of human rights is really nothing new. Uh, you know, it goes back thousands of years in every, virtually every uh, uh, 
culture uh, and, and constitutional system. Uh, but at the international level, the uh, UN Declaration on Human Rights doesn't mention anything about the environment. That's from 1948. And few international agreements said anything about the environment or natural resources. The twin covenants on civil and political rights and on socioeconomic and cultural rights uh, also don't mention the environment. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there wasn't a lot of thinking about whether a right to a healthy environment belongs in the constellation of uh, of human rights um, across the globe that are recognized. Uh, so the idea of it being a human right started actually uh, uh, sort of curiously in the United States with a, a proposal for an amendment to the US Constitution to recognize a right to a decent environment. That was a long time ago, that was in 1968. And then the first constitution to recognize the right anywhere was from the state of Illinois, uh, which uh, recognized the right, everyone's right to a healthy environment. And then uh, the following year in Pennsylvania, in Montana, uh, a few years later in Hawaii, um, in Massachusetts, and most recently in the state of New York, which just last year amended its constitution, much like Chile is doing with very similar language to guarantee everyone's right to clean air and water and a healthful environment. So Chile in that regard is not alone. Um, what we see across the, the world is the extent to which this provision has taken hold. By my count, there are about 84 countries that expressly guarantee a right to a healthy environment. Now that's, those are uh, found in constitutions and in uh, just more than half of those, those are guaranteed as fundamental rights, much like the proposed Chilean constitution. Um, but that's not all. In other countries, uh, uh, courts have construed other, uh, what are called, you know, first generation or first order rights as incorporating a right to a healthy environment, uh, such as a right to life or dignity or health. And we see that in cases, for example, from Bangladesh and Pakistan, um, India and elsewhere. So those cases, those courts have found an implied right to a healthy environment. So more than half of the countries across the globe expressly or impliedly recognize a right to a healthy environment constitutionally, but that's not all because those countries are also part of regional agreements that recognize um, the right as well, either, for example, like the, uh, the uh, Aarhus uh, Convention, the Escazú Agreement, which in their preambulatory provisions in both and in uh, Article One of the Aarhus Agreement recognize the right. Now added to that, we have regional agreements um, about human rights uh, and four of them recognize um, a right to a healthy environment um, led by the African Charter on Peoples um, and Human Rights, the Asian Agreement, the Arab Charter and the Sa San Salvador Agreement. So um, by the United Nations count, about 150 nations or more than 150 nations recognize the right to a healthy environment. So Chile is certainly no, not alone in that regard. And this provision, uh, provision 104, would encapsulate that idea. Um, other provisions in the proposed Chilean constitution would also reflect how environmental constitutionalism appears in constitutions all across um, the globe. Uh, there are uh, about 36 countries or so that uh, recognize sustainability constitutionally, about the same number involve or, or guarantee rights to information, participation and access to justice, justice pardon me, in environmental matters. Um, maybe uh, uh, another 120 by my count or so impose reciprocal duties to protect the environment. So again, this this environmental and ecological constitution that Chile is considering would be a, a reflection of and at the forefront of um, environmental constitutionalism um, across the globe. You may wonder what difference are these provisions making? Well, it, it's still a relatively young right. At the international stage, it wasn't first recognized until the Stockholm Declaration in 1972 that just celebrated its 50th year. Uh, and its constitutional incorporation began arguably with Yugoslavia, but most that the, the longest running constitution uh, is from uh, Portugal. And in that period of time, uh, as countries have recognized the right, 
you know, the jurisprudence takes time, takes time to develop. But by my count of the 84 countries with an express right, uh, there have been uh, apex court decisions about 85 times. So that's an average of one per constitutional provision and just uh, a little bit uh, less than two apex court cases per year since the Stockholm Declaration. So my point there is that there's still a lot of um, uh, potential for environmental rights uh, to make a difference jurisprudentially. We already are beginning to see examples of that, um, including in um, Argentina with the Beatriz Mendoza case, in the Philippines with the case uh, by, the, by miners of POSA, and in Pennsylvania with the Robinson Township and Delaware River, Riverkeeper Network case against the state of Pennsylvania. We see that these provisions can and do make a difference in regular people's lives. Um, so that's a little bit about that provision, 104. 103 uh, is a, uh, also a unique provision, a fairly unique provision uh, that would guarantee the rights of nature. And let me read it to you. Uh, so 103 says that nature has a right to be respected. That's 1031. 1032 says that the state must guarantee and promote the rights of nature. So you may wonder, how unique is that? Well, that's much more unique than the environmental rights provision that we just mentioned in provision 104. Um, in fact, uh, Ecuador is the only, uh, would, would be the only other country on the planet to constitutionally guarantee rights of nature in its Pachamama um, provision. Some countries have guaranteed rights of nature statutorily, legislatively that is, for example, in Bolivia, which has done that. Some countries have recognized and promoted rights of nature uh, jurisprudentially by interpreting other provisions, uh, like a right to life to guarantee rights of nature. We see examples of that from uh, courts in uh, India uh, and Colombia uh, and through the Inter-American Commission and Court uh, on Human Rights, for example. Some countries have guaranteed rights of nature and uh, appointed alms buds persons like the Chilean constitution would do to protect nature. Uh, a leading example there is New Zealand. So it's, again, it's a, it's, it would be, it, the Chilean provision would be a, a pioneering provision in recognition and advancement of um, rights um, of nature. Uh, we also see it as a reflection for whatever it's worth in uh, ordinances and some state laws throughout the United States uh, that have recognized rights of la nature. There is very little case law uh, jurisprudence, that is, on rights of nature. And at least in the United States, uh, there, it hasn't been very successful at all uh, in, in the courts, um, but we see advancements in protection of rights of nature in courts uh, in Ecuador, for example, most principally. So the third and final provision that I'll be mentioning in my remaining time is also a unique provision, uh, and that's 108, which says that the state shall guarantee um, environment or pardon me, access to environmental justice. So environmental justice represents the idea that people should be treated with dignity and fairly in environmental contexts. And it's not typically a constitutional right, but this provision in the Chilean constitution, again, would be transformational in recognizing access to environmental justice. That is the equal and fair treatment and redress of the disproportionate adverse effects of environmental policies on, on people and communities uh, that are vulnerable uh, in Chile and throughout the globe. So that would be a, a fairly unusual provision and the world, world would be watching what Chile would do with that. Um, it, it's also reflective uh, in um, other constitutions, however, as I mentioned earlier, there are about three dozen constitutions that constitutionally recognize rights to participation, information, and access to justice in environmental matters. So in some ways, the Chilean constitution is an embodiment of that, as well as the Aarhus and the Escazú agreements. So that's a brief recap of three provisions of the proposed Chilean constitution, which would be um, pioneering and powerful and be a reflection of the international community's uh, embrace of environmental rights and make a difference in ordinary, ordinary people's uh, lives in Chile and elsewhere and be an inspiration 
for uh, environmental rights enthusiasts across the globe. So thank you again for this opportunity to provide uh, these remarks. I look forward to the conversation. Back to you, Dominique, thank you. Thank you very much, Jimmy, for your inspiring words. I will give now the floor to Luke for his comments. So uh, thank you very much for the invitation to reflect on a text I discovered just uh, three days, uh, three days uh, a a ago. And what is striking, I think, about the draft for this new uh, uh, constitution for Chile is that compared to most constitutions, there is a very large number of provisions regarding the protection of the environment. Most of the time, constitutions are limited to one or two articles or even one or two sentences dedicated to the environment. And for example, in my own country, the Belgian constitution, we have an article 7b about sustainable development, and we have an article 23 on uh, economic, social, and cultural rights. Uh, and uh, one of the, the rights which is mentioned is the right to the protection of a healthy environment. I think the current uh, constitution of Chile uh, there we have Article 19, Paragraph 8, that recognizes the right to life in an environment that's free from contamination. And it states that it is the duty of the state to watch over the protection of these rights and the preservation of nature. And that recognizes that the law may establish specific restrictions on the exercise of certain rights or freedoms in order to protect the environment. In the draft for a new uh, constitution, we have more than 40 articles dealing with different aspects of environmental protection. And those provisions are of a different nature in terms of scope. Uh, sometimes it's the whole environment as such, sometimes it's nature, the clean air, certain parts of the environment as mountains, river banks, sea beaches, habitats, and so on. Also the legal nature, uh, is different. We have substantive rights, we have procedural rights, we have individual rights of, and collective rights versus public or private duties or competencies. And the degree of detail is also uh, varying. If uh, adopted, it will be no doubt the most advanced constitution in terms of environmental protection worldwide, I think. And one can, of course, question the option to provide such an amount of detail uh, in a constitution. But maybe we, we should relativize that remark immediately. Looking, for example, to the European Union and its member states, the principle of primacy of European Union law applies, establishing precedence of European U Union law of conflicting national laws of European Union member states, including national constitutions. This means that secondary European Union law regulations and directives, including in the environmental area, have precedence over domestic law, including national constitutions. So one knows that European Union environmental law is extensive and from time very detailed, Nevertheless, in the hierarchy of norms, it's ranking higher than domestic constitutions. So as such, I think that a constitution which provides a lot of detail in this matter is uh, not a problem. As a constitution, of course, it's more difficult to modify than an ordinary act of parliament. One should, however, make sure that the proposed provisions are by their nature permanent and are not expected to need to be changed or updated on a regular basis. But my first assessment is that that seems to be uh, the case. I would like now to focus uh, to some uh, articles. In the first place, the article seven, uh, 78, 80 and 106, so I understood that in Chile, Chile for a long time, the right to individual property has been considered as the most powerful constitutional right. 
and then when it had to be balanced against environmental protection rights and duties, the balance could from time to time be negative for the environment. In that respect, I think the proposed Article 78 seems to be very important as it refers in its paragraph one to the specific situation of uh, the commons and arti Article 134 regulated in more detail uh, the natural commons. Equally important, I think, is the reference in paragraph two to the ecological function of property. And this is, I think, expected to ensure that when property rights clash with environmental protection, a better balance can be achieved. And the same is true, I think, concerning Article 80 and the exercise of the freedom to undertake and develop economic activities must be compatible with the other constitutional rights and the protection of nature. And Article 106 is a general provision that provides in the same sense that the law may establish restrictions on the exercise of certain rights to protect the environment and uh, nature. I would like now to turn because James has already spoken about uh, Article 108 and 119 to the Articles 148 to 150. It's about the Ombudsman for Nature. It's an autonomous body with legal personality and its own assets. And it shall have as its function the promotion and the protection of the rights of nature and environmental rights guaranteed by the constitution and by binding international environmental treaties against acts or omissions of the organs of the state administration and private uh, entities. The Ombudsman of Nature has broad competences, including processing and following up on complaints about violations of environmental rights and uh, the exercise uh, of constitutional and legal actions when environmental and nature rights are violated and to promote training and education in environment and natural rights. Article 150 provides that the direction of the Ombudsman of Nature will be overseen by a defender of nature who will be appointed in a joint session of the Congress of Deputies and the Chamber of Regents by the majority of uh, its members in office from a list, and that's, uh, uh, I think, uh, remarkable, of three candidates prepared by environmental organizations of the civil society in the manner that will be determined by law. The competences seems to be inspired of that of the Hungarian Ombudsman for Future Generations that had a very positive track record, but which position and function has been meanwhile reviewed and cut down under the Orban government uh, uh, to that of a deputy ombudsman with far less competences. So I think the proposed ombudsman of nature can become, in my view, a crucial actor in enforcing environmental rights in uh, Chile. I would like now to turn to Article 333, and I am very happy to see that the system of environmental courts is confirmed in, art, in that article. And I believe indeed that environmental courts in one or another form are necessary for the enforcement of environmental law because effective enforcement of environmental law demands for specialization. And I refer in that respect to the recently published UNEP Environmental Courts and Tribunals Guide 2021, to which for it, we have contributed from Ghent University as developments in Europe and Africa are concerned. Finally, I am pleased to see in Article 154 
on access to information and public participation in environmental matters that in Europe is mainly regulated on the basis of the Aarhus Convention, but it's also uh, in uh, European Union law, and that has, has inspired the regional agreements on access to information, public participation, and justice in environmental matters in Latin America and the Caribbean, the so-called Escazú Agreement, to which Chile has uh, I think uh, uh, be uh, of has uh, become a party very recently, if I'm not uh, have mis mistaken, one month uh, ago. So these are my initial comments on uh, uh, the draft uh, of the uh, convention after a first uh, reading uh, of the relevant uh, provisions. So. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Luke, for your words. Very interesting to hear what you think of these provisions. Now I will turn the floor to Linda for her words. Comments. Thank you so much, Dominique. Um, it's really an honor to be here. Uh, I want to, right off the bat, just express my gratitude to our colleagues in Chile. This is a monumental contribution to environmental constitutionalism worldwide. I absolutely agree with my co-panelists that this is the high watermark in the creation of a truly ecological constitution. Um, and when I wrote my book, The Ecological Constitution, I was sort of doing a, a world tour of ecological provisions and constitutions throughout history and imagining what an optimal, truly ecologically literate constitution might look like, and this is it. Uh, this draft really does understand and reflect uh, our position as humans in a natural world. Um, it understands and reflects the reality that all government enterprise is wholly dependent on a viable, thriving, natural environment. So I think, uh, you know, possibly for the first time in, in human history, maybe with the exception of Ecuador's constitution, um, we are seeing a constitution that actually, if um, implemented, would have the potential to create sustainability. Obviously, we need international cooperation to achieve that goal. But these kinds of groundbreaking constitutional initiatives um, really drive the growth of ecological literacies in constitutional and judicial systems worldwide. So it's an absolute delight and honor to be even part of this conversation. Um, and again, many thanks to our colleagues in Chile for all of the hard work and thoughtfulness that went into this draft. So I see three absolutely unique and exciting aspects to this constitution. One, it's breadth. Two, it's inclusion of mechanisms for enforcement. And three, it's grounding in key principles of environmental governance. And so briefly in my 10 or 12 minutes, I want to address each one of those. First of all, Luke has already made this point that this is a singularly comprehensive treatment of environmental and ecological rights and obligations. The only constitution globally that comes anywhere close would be the constitution of Ecuador. We've seen in some of the remedial provisions um, in judgments out of India and Bangladesh, for example, you know, similar um, consideration of a diverse range of rights and obligations, um, but there's no constitutional text that has really gone this far. So for example, in the area of nature conservation, we see rights and obligations relating to endangered species specifically, animals specifically, water, air, climate, glaciers, wetlands, mountains, subsoils, and I could go on. 
in the rights of nature um, treatment, we see specifically a right to restoration where necessary. And this is really critical. And again, shows us the ecological literacy of this draft, that we're not um, legislating for a fictitious world, but this draft actually is really grounded in ecological realities. And of course, one of the most daunting realities of our current era is the reality of environmental degradation, existing environmental degradation, that so many of our key ecosystems actually need help, that so many of the life support systems for our communities and nature and nations actually need to be restored. So really encouraging to see um, specific explicit reference to the right to restoration. Also on this topic of the breadth, the comprehensiveness of this draft. In the environmental right, human rights provision, first of all, it's a very well-balanced formulation. It's quite a common formulation, the idea of a healthy and ecologically balanced environment. Um, in the excellent book, Global Environmental Constitutionalism by Jimmy May and Aaron Daly, you'll see excerpted all the different formulations. So countries have described this right in terms of a safe environment, a clean environment, um, some countries speak specifically about sustainability, as, as Jimmy mentioned. This formulation of healthy and ecologically balanced is quite common, but I think it's actually one of the best uh, because it actually kind of breaks down that dichotomy between ecocentrism and anthropocentrism. Now, first of all, I agree wholeheartedly with Dominique that this is a, a uniquely ecocentric constitution. Um, but I'm also really interested in this idea that's emerging that, you know, maybe um, those divisions can actually be deconstructed. That in fact, uh, just a scientifically literate understanding of our own self-interest as humans uh, must include the interests and needs of nature because there really is no biophysical separation between the two. So when we see healthy and ecologically balanced, you know, it implies both an environment that is healthy for humans and an environment that is healthy in its own right. And the idea of balance, of course, um, being probably <laughs> the critical ecological concept that we all need to embrace and understand going forward. So this breadth is really inspiring and, um, if I may take the liberty as a non-judge of saying, I think it can be extremely helpful to judges as these matters come to court, which we know they are, they are going to do. Um, even in countries like my own that don't have the benefit of any explicit environmental rights, um, litigation keeps coming and, and we know we're gonna see this everywhere. So very helpful to have that specific guidance. I could speak for an hour about the breadth and comprehensiveness um, of this draft, uh, but not having time, I'll just move on briefly to uh, the other two points. One, the inclusion of mechanisms for enforcement. So Luke has already done a great job of, of uh, addressing what those are. We have an ombudsman that will be empowered to bring actions to court for violations, both of environmental human rights and rights of nature and crucially the creation of specialized environmental courts. And I think this is just a fantastic idea. Um, and again, we, we have precedents for both of those in a variety of nations around the world. And I'll just make the point, which is uh, probably obvious that, you know, constitutional provisions are only as good as their enforcement. So anything that can be done within a constitutional text to actually uh, pave the way for implementation on the ground, which is what we need, um, is incredibly value added. So the inclusion of, again, these very thoughtful mechanisms for enforcement and implementation is hugely important. Uh, beyond the uh, inclusion of an ombudsman that can bring these actions, also really important that the constitution just gives standing to any person to bring environmental rights violations to court. I mean, that has been, we've seen provisions like that, standing provisions like that in, in American environmental law and in a number of constitutional um, provisions in Latin America. And it's been really, really important for empowering civil society um, 
to really implement these important provisions. Then finally, thirdly, this constitution is grounded in widely recognized key principles of environmental governance. And I could point to numerous um, provisions that demonstrate this, but I'll just read out um, possibly the most explicit, which is Article 128, which holds the principles for the protection of nature and the environment are at least those of progressivity, precaution, prevention, environmental justice, intergenerational solidarity, responsibility, and fair climate action. So these are the tried and tested principles of environmental governance that are reflected in international environmental treaties and also domestic environmental legislation. These are the principles that we have learned over the previous five decades are necessary for uh, achieving effective environmental protection. Let's see if I can do in one minute a brief, um, a brief overview of each of them. So progressivity, there's a principle called non-regression in a number of constitutional environmental rights worldwide that basically says, given the nature of the ecological crisis, environmental protection cannot be eroded. It can't get worse. So whatever protection you have in place now, it has to stay the same. Progressivity goes one step further and says, in fact, environmental protection mechanisms have to get better over time. So very um, progressive, very exciting um, principle to see included. Precaution, again, we could speak for weeks on the precautionary principle, but this boiled down to its simplest um, idea is better safe than sorry. In other words, where there is scientific uncertainty, as is almost always the case in environmental disputes, we take the safest route. We err on the side of caution. Crucially important, for giving meaning to any environmental right or indeed any environmental law provision at all. Uh, prevention, very closely related to precaution. Environmental justice, I think this, my time will be up here. So I'll just, I'll just say this, we live in a very challenging moment in human history. And there is no question that if we want to stabilize the earth systems that have sustained thriving human communities over time, we need to take quite profound action to protect and restore ecosystems. At the same time, and happily, wonderfully, we live probably at the apex of human understanding of the importance of all members of our communities, the centrality of equality and equity. And so as we move towards more sustainable modes of living, we have the opportunity to do it in a way that simultaneously increases fairness, equity, equality, the chance for all members of our communities to have happy, healthy, thriving lives. And, and that is what is embodied of the idea of environmental justice, that the move towards allocating environmental benefits and burdens equitably, fairly. And it's crucially important, um, particularly as we do make our economic changes to transition towards solidarity, that we do that in ways that strengthen social solidarity um, rather than weaken it. There's so much more I'd love to say, but I will leave it there and open it up for questions. Um, and again, just congratulations on this draft. No matter where it goes from here, this has been just a critical contribution um, to our collective understanding of what constitutions can do um, in, on the path towards ecological sustainability. Thank you very much, Linda, for your words. Very interesting to hear what you have to say. And now um, we will go to um, questions. And uh, there are a few questions in um, here in the chat, but I think also I will give the word to Domingo Lovera, who has a question, and then I will come back to, to read the other questions and to for some of my questions. So. Domingo, please feel free to intervene now in the panel. Um, hi, uh, thanks, Dominique. Um, thanks, Linda, Jimmy, and Luke for your uh, words on the on the environmental provisions of the proposal. Um, I cannot but feel body shivers as you were talking about the provisions. Uh, you know that these provisions have caused uh, heated debate. Uh, 
on, on our community about uh, their relevance, uh, their importance, and of course, uh, uh, the impact that these provisions will have. But at the same time, as Linda just ended up saying, we are living a critical moment, uh, of course, in, in Chile as well as in the rest of the world, concerning the degradation of, of the planet, of the, of the environment, and of the different um, life support systems. So I think these provisions come in a timely uh, moment. And, and as you said, uh, all of you, this may actually provide a, a, key, um, a key example for the rest of the countries uh, in what is, I believe, the most urgent political, constitutional, uh, and social matter that we have at hand uh, in the following years. I just posted uh, in the chat uh, an, a transitory article that may be useful in addressing the different questions that you are uh, people receiving in, in the questions. So just wanted to say that. Uh, so you may want to take a look at that because it uh, mandates the president with the task of uh, of submitting a, a filing a, a bill uh, on the one hand, but at the same time on convening a commission that is called a commission on, uh, on ecological transition. So it will be composed by members of civil society, indigenous peoples, uh, academics, and so on. And it should uh, elaborate the basis for this uh, ecological transition. But I leave it to you there so you can actually reflect on, on what that uh, transitional provision is, is proposing to do once if the constitution comes into force. Thank you, Domingo. That's a very good uh, thing you did to um, to have on site this transition uh, provision. Before I give the word to the panelists, I will read these two questions that were coming from the chat and give a bit of an explanation to for the panelists to understand one of these questions. One, one of the question is if in other part of the world, there are water rights like in Chile. Uh, this question has to be explained in a way, I think, in case you don't understand the, the system we have in Chile of water rights. Um, in the current constitution, the constitution guarantees private property over water rights. So that's something that has been very contested in these last years and decades in Chile. And the proposal of the new constitution um, uh, eliminates this private property over water rights. And it specifically says that no authorization for the use of water, I mean, that property rights cannot be given to authorizations for the use of common natural goods, uh, which are inappropriable. And these are specifically water, water rights. It could be some others, but specifically water rights. And on the other hand, the, the text also provides for the human water, human right to water and sanitation. So I think those two are the, the, the provisions that have to be considered in order to um, have an understanding of what this question means. No, if there is any other part of the world in which um, water rights exist. And the other question of the public has to do with um, to something that Professor Collins speaks of. And it says that uh, Professor Collins speaks of the breadth of the provisions in this groundbreaking ecocentric draft constitution. What do the panelists consider potential challenges in implementation if the draft is passed in September? And do the transitional provisions address any concerns in implementation. Regarding that last question as well, um, besides the provision that Domingo shared in the, in the chat, there are other transitional provisions regarding environmental and natural resources matters, which basically establish ta a timetable, like um, the, the time that the uh, Congress has for the past legislation in order to implement certain rights or certain institutions. Uh, so there is some, there are some, a few which are a bit long, so I don't think it's possible to, to share it with you, but the, there are some timetables for the implementation. And also I would like to make one question to all of you, to whatever, whoever wants to answer. 
that has to do with this standing that you all mentioned, I think, this standing that is recognized for anyone to, um, to claim judicially about these environmental rights or nature rights. And that has been, in a way, uh, criticized because it can promote uh, more litigation and um, that wouldn't be a problem for, um, for the courts that are already um, with too much you know, uh, cases. And if that would be um, something that would uh, make it impossible to deal with all the environmental litigation that would come if this broad standing is passed. So um, I think those are some questions that you could um, consider for your next comments. Um, of course, feel free to say anything else you couldn't say before. And we have like a few minutes for each of you to comment on these questions and whatever else you want to say. So let's start with Jimmy again. Jimmy, I give you the word now. Sure, thank you. Uh, and thank you for those questions. Uh, I'll do my best to answer what I can in, in just maybe a, a minute or, or two tops here. Uh, taking them in order about water rights. Uh, yes, is the answer. There are constitutions that instantiate a right to water and sanitation. Uh, this is, again, by my count. And there's an appendix in the book that Linda mentioned that Aaron Daly and I wrote on global environmental constitutionalism that lists these countries, okay? Uh, so you can find more about it there. But the, the right to water and water is mentioned more than 300 times throughout the globe in constitutions. The right to water is specifically guaranteed, again, by my count, in at least 14, one, four, 14 of those countries, um, including uh, South Africa as a leading example. And a leading case construing that provision is the Mazabuko decision, um, applying progressive realization uh, to the right to water in that country. So that's just an example. Again, I'm sure that Linda and Luke have more to add to that. So that's one. Uh, secondly, about um, property rights and, and water rights and about uh, what one might call constitutional hierarchy. You know, which do some rights trump other rights? Do property rights trump water rights? The answer here again is yes. Uh, the prevailing view across the globe in common law, civil and other systems is that property rights tend to um, have hierarchy uh, over water rights. Now, of course, constitutionally that can flip, uh, that, can, that can change. And off the top of my head, I don't remember uh, if there are examples of countries that have changed that. I know in the United States, there are some uh, uh, constitutional provisions that do just that. California has a right to water, for example, in its constitution. It's a fairly young provision, so it remains to be seen how it uh, affects other property rights. But generally in the United States, property rights are at the top of uh, kind of the rights um, pyramid. Okay, and third and last is a, a tough question. It's about implementation. That's the way I heard Dominique's question, however, is about you know, what to do with these provisions, um, how to tell whether they work. I get back to Luke and Linda's observations about how constitutional provisions are only as good as they are enforced. I think that's what Linda said. And so again, that remains to be seen uh, with these proposed Chilean provisions. But what distinguishes the, the proposed Chilean system from many, if not most systems around the globe, nationally and even sub-nationally, is that there are mechanisms for enforcement. One is this commission on ecological transition, which looks to be to, to investigate legislative, regulatory, and constitutional mechanisms for implementation. Two is the person, person sorry, who has authority constitutionally to um, uh, invoke and involve uh, rights to uh, uh, environmental rights and rights of nature and other rights. So look, uh, time will tell, I, I don't know. It's again, it's a unique and pioneering uh, proposed constitution. It's, it will be, it will be kind of uh, uh, be a, a test uh, run, a test balloon of many of these provisions, but it looks to have mechanisms in place 
to make implementation much more likely. Sorry for talking for three minutes. Sorry. Thank you very much, Jimmy and uh, Luke. Now I give you. Thank you. Uh, on the issue of uh, water rights, uh, uh, in addition to what uh, has been uh, said, I would uh, like to draw your attention to what's Article 143. And I think that's also a very important uh, provision. It's uh, about uh, the integrated watershed uh, management. And uh, looking to that provision, uh, my feeling was this is just a summary of uh, the European Union Water Framework Directive, because uh, before that, so that directive uh, exists since 2001, before there were specific directives on water quality, on water quantity, uh, and so on, but there was no integrated uh, approach. And uh, that uh, European Union uh, uh, framework that uh, directive on water management is more or less uh, uh, obliging member states to do what's uh, written down in uh, article 143 and for example for the implementation of that directive uh, i was involved uh, 20 years ago in drafting the legislation for belgium and we have uh, this uh, river basin councils and uh, and authorities and so on, nearly like it's written down in in that article. So so uh, this uh, seems uh, uh, to be, uh, in my opinion, a good idea. Another issue is uh, the uh, monopoly for this national water agency. Uh, so I think uh, looking to the, towards the situation we have uh, within the European Union, I think in most member states, if not all, if one is speaking uh, about uh, providing drinking water, that's in uh, most, if, um, probably in uh, every member state because the situation might have been different in the UK, for some years, it's a uh, competence of public authorities. As we have uh, water uh, purification, there one can have systems with mixed uh, institutions. Uh, we have uh, uh, member states where it's, it's only public. We have institutions where it's it's uh, mixed uh, where there is some participation uh, from uh, private parties uh, in uh, those uh, bodies. But for example, in my own country, we had for some time uh, a, mixed, uh, a mixed institution. So it was mainly public, but it was private capital indeed, but finally, uh, this has changed and now it's, it's also 100% public. So it seems that it's going a little bit uh, in the same direction, but uh, let's say on the level of uh, constitutions, I don't think uh, that we have in the European uh, Union uh, domestic constitution where it's uh, de developed in the same uh, detail uh, as uh, is proposed, for example, in uh, uh, Article 144. Then maybe the, the other aspect, uh, Axio Populares, indeed. Uh, I think uh, Article 100 and, uh, 119, uh, Paragraph 1 and Paragraph 8 uh, provides uh, both for an Axio Popularis as, uh, as has been uh, said already, the possibility of the Ombudsman for Nature to uh, introduce court cases. Now, looking to some of the countries, it's, uh, I, I agree it's an exception, but for example, in Portugal, uh, the Portuguese constitution provides also an actual 
populares, but this has not uh, led to an overburdening of uh, courts. So the impression is maybe even uh, when there is no, uh, let's say, uh, problem of legal standing, of course, preparing, introducing a court case demands uh, an important effort uh, and uh, sometimes uh, also involve uh, uh, the payments uh, of uh, money for, for, for lawyers, etc. So the impression is, however, that this in itself uh, has as a consequence that only, let's say, uh, serious cases are brought to the courts and, and that this is not leading uh, to uh, overburden uh, overburden uh, uh, courts. So that's, let's say, the experience we have uh, in, in, in Europe. And I think one may uh, expect uh, that uh, similar uh, situation uh, will uh, uh, will come uh, in uh, in Chile uh, if uh, those provisions uh, would be adopted. I think. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Luke. Linda. Um, in the interest of time, I'll just comment on the second and third questions because I think the water question has been ably dealt with by my colleagues. Challenges to implementation. I guess first we can think about implementation challenges um, in two categories. There are internal challenges, the so challenges we can find that are inherent in the text itself, and then external challenges to implementation. So in the first category, we see, for example, there are some constitutions around the world that have put their environmental human right in a non-enforceable part of the constitution. And it's sort, of, it's sort of aspirational. And so that has essentially no hope of um, being enforced. That's an example of an internal challenge. This draft internally is you know, about as strong as a constitution could be not only because it creates this really important infrastructure for enforcement, but it's also doctrinally, conceptually so strong. So for example, um, scholars of ecological law have been saying for a long time that one of the reasons why environmental law has failed in some important respects, it has succeeded in other important respects, but one of the reasons why environmental law has not produced global sustainability is that it has been conceived as a separate area of law that kind of operates at the margins and is somehow supposed to be able to fix problems that are embedded in the very nature of our economies and, and political systems. And so what ecological law theorists have done, if you read, for example, the Oslo Manifesto has argued that what we need if we want to sustain our human communities is to internalize the ecological preconditions of human life in all forms of law, and most crucially in property law. And we see these inherent ecological constraints on economic and property rights included in this constitution, which makes it singularly well-equipped, I think, to do the job that it is setting out to do. So in terms of the draft itself, I personally can't think of anything else that could have been done to overcome the inevitable challenges that arise in implementing constitutional environmental provisions or any kind of provisions, really. But then you come to the category of external challenges, challenges outside the four corners of the document. And obviously, these are manifold and daunting. Um, and, you know, it's the challenge of creating sustainability in a global capitalist system that is not based on ecological realities. Um, and, you know, realistically, of course, it's going to be challenging to implement these provisions. However, what's the alternative? You know, it's, it's also quite challenging to just watch the environment around you sort of crumble and the life systems that are necessary to sustain your state. And, you know, we actually saw that in Chile with the incredible social unrest resulting from inequitable distribution of water. And in fact, I think 
as ecological provisions are implemented, we can learn collectively that in fact, our environmental and economic thriving are inherently interdependent. So for example, you take this really unique, specific human right to clean air in this constitution that, that is again, a, an incredibly unique feature of this particular constitution. The UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment has told us that about 7 million people die prematurely in globally every year as a result of air pollution. Imagine the costs in healthcare and lost productivity. And then obviously the most important costs in human suffering, the loss of breadwinners and caregivers. You know, as we clean up air pollution, and this is something where we've seen um, very significant successes in a number of parts of the world, as we clean up air pollution, people get healthier, we actually see huge economic benefits. So as you know, these provisions are implemented, I think that even the economy itself can learn that in fact, you know, environmental regulation, ecological sustainability is not the enemy. It's, it's an absolute um, prerequisite to environmental thriving. And finally, and I just want to, you know, really frankly acknowledge this, anytime you have a groundbreaking constitution like this in environmental matters, you have the challenge of international cooperation. And I think there's no question that in order to fully realize the vision of this constitution, we will need to, at the same time, see an evolution in global environmental consciousness and you know, effective international cooperation, because many of these problems cannot be handled single-handedly. Um, however, we also have a great track record of seeing how different countries' experiments in ecological constitutionalism spread. So we see, you know, a wonderful judgments on rights of nature from India, uh, referencing statutory rights of nature in New Zealand and constitutional rights of nature in Ecuador. And we know that um, we are in a global marketplace constitutionally now. So I think this constitution in itself makes it more likely that we see progressive developments elsewhere around the world that can lead to the kind of international cooperation that is absolutely necessary um, to achieve global sustainability. Thank you, Linda, as well for that last remark. It's very interesting to see that, of course, this will mean international debate and cooperation if this uh, text is approved. I will have um, a few more minutes and um, I would like to ask you uh, one question and see what you think of it. It has been uh, contested in Chile, this new category or legal category of natural common goods or natural commons. I would like to ask you if uh, what do you think of this new legal cate category or concept? If you have seen it somewhere else uh, or, or the scope it finally was included of this legal concept in the text of the proposal. Because I think this is, for my experience, something new in the legal debate at least. Um, and this concept will have to be also um, interpreted and developed in the um, legislation and uh, decisions, public decisions. So uh, I don't know if any one of you wants to comment on that, or if also if you want to uh, say something else uh, besides that question. So feel free to, if any one of you wants to talk about this, uh, just. I mean, I can jump in on that. It, the, the concept of the commons has a legal history in the common law world, um, which the commons were common areas of land where everyone was permitted to graze their cattle. And we now have seen scholars theorizing really interesting expansion um, of that idea. I highly recommend the book, The Ecology of Law, which goes into this in some depth. And there's lots more writing specifically on the commons. I would just say, I think that the commons is an inevitable legal concept. Because again, you know, if we want as lawyers and constitutionalists to play a role in preserving our human societies over time, law really has to become ecologically literate. It's, it's not optional, it's, it's necessary. And the reality is, you know, almost any crucial earth system that one can think, all of them, they're all commons. 
they are all held in common. You know, the atmosphere is a commons, the ocean is a commons. So I think, you know, of course it will be difficult because we haven't seen codification of the commons in you know, many, many centuries. And we've never seen codification of the commons on this kind of scale. But I think it's a worthy experiment because it's just necessary to bring constitutional law in line with ecological reality. May I add from a civil law perspective that the Code of Napoleon also have uh, the commons uh, in it and it's, uh, you can find the definition and I, I'm not sure, but uh, probably uh, in the, the, the civil code of Chile, uh, one finds it uh, also uh, some goods uh, are uh, not, cannot be appropriated. The use is common to everybody and public law is uh, organizing how uh, this can be, be used. These are the commons in a general sense. And uh, uh, I have the impression that Article 134 is going a little bit further when these uh, common goods or uh, natural common uh, uh, goods, you have some uh, additional uh, provisions. Uh, for example, the duty uh, of uh, the state uh, to protect uh, it uh, and, and so on, because uh, you have, of course, uh, what is, is known as the tragedy of the commons. If no one takes care uh, uh, of it, and uh, there will be depletion. So I see it as uh, more or less as, an, as an, uh, a modern and uh, ecologically interpreted version uh, of the provision you can find in the, the Code of Napoleon. If I could just add there, um, so it also has echoes of the public trust doctrine, um, which of course, you know, goes back to Roman times and beforehand. And um, uh, I think both of you have written about it. So uh, just the thing to add here is that the idea of constitutionalizing the commons would be, I think, I, I believe it is unique. Again, I'm welcome to be corrected on that. Um, but the idea of the public trust of, of the government holding, in essence, common areas in public trust for public good is something that has been constitutionalized about two dozen times in countries across the globe. And then, in, then subnationally in constitutional provisions for virtually every state in Brazil, every launder in Germany, and one state in the United States, that's Pennsylvania. So um, anyway, uh, so it's a, not the same thing, but a related idea. Thank you very much, all of you, for this very interesting discussion and panel. I'm very honored to have shared this panel with all of you. It's really interesting to hear what you think about these provisions. And I think it's a very, um, we have, as you say, Linda, we are living in a very interesting moment. And in Chile, especially, we have this opportunity. Um, and I think it's a very interesting to discuss it and to know what other people think of this um, text and proposal of constitution we have in Chile. So we can have a more uh, distant look of what we are doing here. And so that it has been really interesting to hear that. And I think we should be finishing by now. So I will give back the word to Ken. And thanks a lot again to all of you for this interesting discussion. Thank you, Dominique, uh, for a wonderful moderating job. Luke, Linda, Jimmy, of course, Domingo, always. Uh, this was extremely enlightening. I, I feel like the, the bad guy sort of closing it out at this point, but we have gone a little bit further and we don't want to abuse our panelists of their time any, any further. Uh, I'd like to remind those who are listening that a video in English and Spanish will be made available no later than tomorrow, uh, hopefully tonight, but we'll see how that editing process goes. Uh, it's available at ccacanada.com. So feel 
free to view it and to distribute it widely in your networks. Uh, we certainly think those of us who organize this event um, that it's it merits seeing uh, being seen by a wider audience, uh, hopefully particularly in, in Chile. Uh, with that, I would just remind everybody that we will be back again the same time next Wednesday at 10 o'clock with our fourth in the series of putting the proposed Chilean contact, uh, constitution in international context with constitutional experts discussing women's rights. Uh, and these experts come from Chile, from Spain, from Canada and from Colombia. Uh, and so we hope you can join us uh, for that. And if you'd like to get onto our mailing list, as I mentioned, it's ccacanada.com. Um, we've been pretty busy uh, the last several years and we hope you can join us for more of these. With that, thank you, Domingo again. Thank you again for all the extensive collaboration. Um, and we look forward to convening again on the environment uh, for sure. This is, this is not the end of this conversation uh, and in convening uh, about other issues which we think are, are critical uh, for, for Canada, for the region and for the world. Thank you very much again for joining us. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, everyone.